Sometimes I don't even know if I believe in the phrase learn from my mistakes because frankly, plant friends, sometimes the mistakes are fun to make. I love making mistakes in the garden. They're how you learn the best lessons. But when it comes to today's podcast episode, seed starting and learning from mistakes that me and guest Joe Lample have made, I understand the pain of dealing with precious seeds that you've worked so hard to select and not wanting to waste seed starting materials. And I'm hoping that we can put this phrase to good use to save you from some seed starting fails and the emotional toil that comes along with losing that tray of beloved tomato seeds to a watering mistake or frying an entire flat of flower starts because of incorrect grow light installation. Believe me, I've done both of these, as you'll learn in today's episode. I want seeds starting to bring you so much joy that it feels like your heart is going to explode because that is what seed starting feels like for me. I do not want it to be stressful for you or disappointing for you, plant friends. So this whole episode is dedicated to you learning from our mistakes. Mine and Joe Lample, the gardener who has started more seeds than probably anyone listening to this podcast or most gardeners in general. So get excited for this honest conversation that I hope leaves you inspired and empowered. Welcome to the Growing Joy with Plants podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives by doing so. I'm Maria, former plant killer turned happy plant lady, author of Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, your new best plant friend. On Growing Joy with Plants, you'll find conversations about houseplant care, gardening tutorials, and wellness through the lens of plants. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy. Hello, plant friends. Welcome back to the Growing Joy with Plants podcast. I'm Maria, your best plant friend, and I'm here to help you care for plants successfully and grow more joy in your life while doing so. Case in point, I'm going to help you try and save some pain in your life with this episode on seed starting mistakes. Before we dive into the podcast episode, I just wanted to let you know, in case any of you listening here, which by the way, I'm so thankful that you come to the show on a weekly basis and listen and grow with me as a plant parent. It's like the best and ultimate honor of my life, but we have relaunched our YouTube channel. So if you like plant tube, if you like YouTube, if you're a visual learner and you like visual companions to what we're learning on the podcast, or just you like learning about plants on YouTube, you should go check me out. It's growing joy with Maria on YouTube. We have invested heavily into our YouTube channel this year. We've got really high quality demonstrations on how to make kokodama, a deep dive in alocasia with a visual representation of all the varieties that I talked about on the podcast episode a couple weeks back. We're going to have all sorts of planty DIY tutorials, crafts, genus deep dives. It's going to be an amazing free resource for you. So go over to Growing Joy with Maria on YouTube and subscribe if you enjoy YouTube. And if not, just stay subscribed to this podcast because I'm bringing you weekly podcasts to help you bloom and grow joy in your life. Speaking of growing joy in your life, I know that discounts are probably something that make you happy. Joe and I are going through all the mistakes that we've learned while seed starting. If you are planning on starting seeds this year, if you want some support, if you're looking for a course like to take your seed starting knowledge to the next level beyond what like a free one hour podcast episode could give to you. Joe is in the process of launching his master seed starting course. I've taken and retaken the course like three times. You'll hear me talk about it in the episode today. It's running through January 29th, which is this upcoming Monday. And if you use my affiliate link, growingjoywithmaria.com slash seed starting, you're going to get $100 off. So if you want $100 off Joe's course, Master Seed Starting, go to growingjoywithmaria.com slash seed starting. It'll be linked in the show notes. I'm not going to talk about it anymore here because I talk about it in the interview, but it's a fabulous course if you need support in that area. Without further ado, let's dive right into this conversation. Here is the famous, the well-known Joe Lample of joegardner.com, Joe Gardner podcast, the Joe Gardner show, Joe Gardner YouTube. He's amazing. He's a repeat guest on the podcast Make sure that you go back throughout the feed and listen to all the episodes he's joined us. But without further ado, here's Joe. Joe, welcome back to Growing Joy. Hey, Maria. It's good to be back. Good to be back. I've lost count of how many times you've been on the show at this point, frankly. (laughs) That's good. That's good. 
Yeah, I like that. Me too. Yeah. No, there are only a few people who I've lost count how many times they've been on the show. So that's like in Saturday Night Live, the like five time jacket award. I feel like I need to make jackets for you. <laughs> yeah, you do it. People. <laughs> I'd love it. So how has your year in the garden been? The last time we talked, you had just installed your greenhouse. Yeah. You had just launched your OVG gardening course. Like what did your garden season look like this summer? It was phenomenal. It was crazy. You know, last year and this year were great because last year we were filming OVG, Organic Vegetable Gardening Course, our, our biggest course, and it took all hands on deck. But I had to make sure that everything looked tip top, you know, to the best of my ability because Mother Nature is always in charge. But we were very uh, on top of everything. And thank goodness, Mother Nature was very kind to us. We didn't have any failures. Everything was great. And um, this year, Having completed the course, you know, I was tired, but we had added flowers this year. We went head first into adding a lot of flowers into our food garden this year to attract the beneficial insects and the pollinators. And oh my gosh, it was gorgeous. And the garden came alive. And so it was just like being in a different place without ever going anywhere. And so we're just going to continue to add to that. So I, I'm like a kid in a candy store and every year is more fun than the year before every day for that matter. But yes, let me wrap it up by saying it was a phenomenal year. And adding the flowers had a lot to do with that. You're a flower daddy now. I am. And today I was filming a video on planting roses. That's something I haven't done since I was a kid. So I mean, I've been bitten by the flower bug. Let me tell you what. That's amazing. Yeah, I feel I grew flowers for the first time two years ago. And I feel like the joy that the flowers brought me almost eclipsed the joy that my tomatoes brought me. I dare say that, but it is, it's different. And I feel like the flowers bloom, like you get a longer bloom period. And I don't know, there's something real special about growing flowers. There is, but when you grow them in the same environment, it's extra special because you get the best of both worlds, you know, and they're different. You can experience amazing joy from the tomatoes as well as the flowers or whatever it is you're growing. And you enjoy them for different reasons and it's all good. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. Did you have a favorite one, favorite flower of your summer? the risk of being cliche, I still love the zinnias because they're so varied and so colorful yeah, and so bright too. and so easy to grow and so cooperative and the pollinators love them. And like, what's not to love about those? But then again, you mix in the dahlias. And I mean, we had gorgeous flowers. Toby, my farm manager was out there and she's a flower expert. And it was stunning. The bouquets that were coming into the house every week would take your breath away. So... Yeah. Oh, I'm sure your wife was thrilled. My entire rebrand, the whole color scheme of my entire rebrand was inspired by a zinnia that I grew. Yeah. The State Farm zinnia, the like fuchsia State Farm zinnia. They're just the best and they're sturdy and they're easy to grow. Shout out to the zinnias. But anyway, <laughs> you know, you might grow flowers and there are zinnia actually is a great example of flowers that just make sense to start from seed. Yes. Um, because with flowers, sometimes, you know, they don't transplant well. And zinnias, you know, they grow so easily from seed that why not do that? Today, we're talking about seed starting because I know seed starting is something that is so near and dear to your heart. I feel like multiple times graduate of your seed starting master seed starting course. How many years have you been growing your garden from seed at this point? All of them. I rarely buy a transplant. And it's not that there's anything wrong with transplants, but when you know how to start plants from seed, it almost goes against the grain when you have to turn around and buy something you know you can start from seed. But there are times where there's a plant that I do need to grow and I forgot to start it from seed. And so I got to run to the garden center and get it. And then that's okay. You know, you can you can let yourself off the hook for that. But uh, once you figure out the nuances of starting seed, and most of them are started generally the same way. Now, there are some that have particulars that, you know, need some special attention because that's how they roll. But otherwise, by learning to start something from seed, you apply that knowledge to more and more and more seeds. And before you know it, you are very comfortable growing them. And then you don't want to buy them already grown. If you've got the time and the place and the, or the space to start them from seed, at least in my opinion, in the opinion of many people I've talked to, it's such a fun activity and you learn so much through the process of physically starting that seed and nurturing it as a seedling to getting it into the ground. You embrace the learning opportunities that come from every year that you do that, that it would be anticlimactic to buy a seedling at that point when you have the opportunity to take care of that whole process yourself. It's, it's just another form of gardening. I believe you learn more from the time that you sow a seed into the ground until you transplant it out into the garden. That six to eight week period of time, I think you learn more about 
how a plant grows and the biology of a plant, the botany of a plant, then you do the rest of the time that it's in the garden. Those first six to eight weeks are, there's so much that changes in that period of time. And if you're paying attention, you learn so much from it. It is so magical. For me, with seed starting, number one, you know, I love a tiny plant. I love a micro dwarf. And so I feel like the variety that I can get if I start seeds is so much more wide than what's at my garden center, especially where I live. I have an amazing garden center where I live, but they're pretty generic. Like the tomatoes are pretty generic. The cucumbers are pretty generic. And I like to grow my like mini snacking cucumbers and my mini tomatoes. And I'm not going to be able to get those starts where locally where I live. And yeah, it's magic. It's magic to see a little speck of a seed burst into a little cotyledon and then a big green plant. It's just so fun. It's hard to explain until you've done it. I can imagine people that haven't started seed and hearing two people geek out about how fun it is to start that seed. Until you've done it, you can't knock it. But when you do start a seed, you you just take ownership of it. It's like your child. You know, it's like this is under your control. You're responsible for its well-being from now until you, well, however long. But um, there's a big sense of responsibility there and you own it and you love the responsibility and you take on the challenge and, uh, you know, you're checking on your seedlings 10, 20, 30 times a day. I'm not exaggerating by that. And uh, every day you see the progress. And like I said before, there's a lot of growth in four to six weeks or eight weeks. And it's exciting. I don't know a better word for it than the fact that it is exciting. Totally. It's like, you know, the when you, on Instagram, when you see those people, when they just have a baby where they take the like one month photo and the two month photo and the three month photo, you're doing that with your seeds, but like every single day, because you're tracking how fast they're growing. So, you know, you mentioned don't knock it till you try it. Yes, plant friends, don't judge me and Joe until you've tried it and experienced the joy for yourself. But let's take me for example, I had house plants for years, caring for them successfully before I tried, I started seed starting. Seed starting is a totally kind of different vocabulary. You need different stuff. You need seed starting stuff. You need seed starting mix. You and I have multiple episodes on this podcast that are seed starting basics. We'll link them in the show notes if people want. Joe last year came on and did like a step-by-step seed starting tutorial, but it is, it's like a totally different language. It can be a little intimidating your first and second time. And I remember the first time I took your seed starting course, I was so nervous (laughs) trying to do it and wanting to do it correctly. And, you know, wanting to nurture these little seeds. And now I've started seeds, you know, I think four summers in a row, you have decades of experience starting seeds. And I think the both of us, you in particular have seen you know, the common mistakes. So we're going to go through these five mistakes that are the most common, most common errors people make in the garden. Where are you sourcing these top five mistakes from? Is it you personally? Is it your audience? I know I can resonate with most of them. So talk to me how, how you came to these five tips. I'm sure I've made all of these five mistakes and more, but I think the ones that are on this list that we're going to talk about today have come from uh, my students in the Online Guardian Academy and the in the Master Seed Starting Course. It's uh, year, many years now with these students asking questions because that's part of what they get in the course is the you know access to me to ask whatever question they want to know about seed starting. And um, I've heard these five trouble spots many, many times. And, uh, you know, there's no quick answer. I'm going to try to do my best to summarize, you know, how to get around these, these challenges, but, um, these are very common. So it's natural that these yeah, would be so the don't feel bad plant different. friends. Yeah. Yeah. For <laughs> yeah. Sure. I don't think anybody just does seed starting perfectly from the first time that they've tried. And if the, and if you do, then good for you. But I think most of the time it's going to take you a couple of seasons to really hone your skills, learn from your own experience, but hopefully with this episode, you save yourself a few mistakes. A lot of times I've found that people don't get around to ever starting seeds because they're, they think they don't have the right equipment or they're afraid they're going to mess up, you know, and they don't know enough, they think to get started, but that is the farthest thing from the truth. And in the course of this conversation, I'll be sure to explain that you don't need expensive equipment and you don't need to wait. The way that we learn in gardening, and especially with seed starting, is just to do it Let me tell you, the DNA in that seed is programmed to want to germinate and sprout and grow. We just got to kind of get out of its way. And sometimes we we love the seed to death. I mean, we we actually over care for it. And so if we just kind of let go a little bit, I think we'd be pleasantly surprised. So if you're one of those people that 
feels like you don't know enough to get started or you think you need more equipment than you've got or you can't afford to get started, that go buy a $2 pack of seeds and a clamshell from your takeout food and, you know, we'll get you going. And get the party started. I literally tell this story every time you come on my show to talk about seed starting with me. But one of the pivotal moments in my beginning gardening career, I I'd called my mom and I was, you know, so stressed about starting seeds. And she was like, Maria, it's a seed. Put it in the dirt. It's going to grow. Like, get over yourself. And lo and behold, it did. So, all right. So hit me with your first most common seed starting mistake that you see people make. Okay. And this is in no particular order, but I'll start off with the fact that okay. their seeds just don't germinate. So they've done what you've said and your mom is is right for most of the time, but there are things that we do that can prevent the seed from germinating. And there are a few main reasons why a seed doesn't germinate. And the first one is seeds, depending on the, the type of seed, they all have a preferred temperature in the soil in which they will germinate. So it's a pretty forgiving range. It may be from 50 to 85 degrees. You know, that's a pretty wide range of, in Fahrenheit of what it can tolerate to sprout. But if we put it into soil that's either too cool or, you know, outside of those parameters, too cool or too hot for that preferred range for that seed, it's not going to germinate. So that's the first reason seeds wouldn't germinate is the soil temperature is not appropriate for that type of seed. And again, it's a wide range. So it's probably, you're probably not going to screw up there, but it is a reason why it would not germinate. Secondly, we plant them too deep or too shallow. We may not follow the directions on the seed pack because the information is there. We just need to pay attention and take 10 seconds to read what's on the seed pack because it tells you how deep to plant the seed. But if we don't know, you know, we might stick it in too deep or not deep enough. And in either case, it may not germinate. For example, if it's too deep, the little energy pack that's inside of that seed coat is everything that seed needs to germinate, assuming that it's planted at the depth that nature intended that seed to be planted at. So it's got its protein, its fats, its carbohydrates. It's basically its fuel tank to send out a root and send up a shoot and get above the soil before it runs out of that internal energy and then the leaves pick up the sun to drive it from there. But if we plant it too deep, well, the seed's still going to send out the root and it's still going to send up the shoot, but it's going to utilize the energy pack and the seed coat to make that happen. And if it has farther to travel to get through the soil before it runs out of energy, that would be a reason why it doesn't germinate. We planted it too deep. On the other hand, we plant it too shallow. Maybe it's a pea seed that's, you know, everybody knows what a pea looks like. Well, that's what the seed looks like too. And if you don't plant it about two inches deep, it's sitting on the surface and it really needs to be covered up by soil. In fact, some seeds will not germinate in the presence of light. So therefore you need to plant it below the soil surface. So it needs to be a certain depth. And some seeds will only germinate in the presence of light, like lettuce. So if we don't pay attention to the information on the seed pack, those are other reasons why the seed may not germinate. Too deep, too shallow, too hot, too cold. So those are the first two of the five things I think I've listed here. I've also found that the first time before I took seed, master seed starting, the first time I tried starting seeds, I put the seed in the soil at the appropriate measure, but the soil was dry. So then when I watered the soil, the water bubbled up and the seed just like floated to the top of the soil. And I was like, well, this is annoying. I now have to replace the seeds. So that's another error I've made in regards to, you know, how deep, how deep to plant a seed. That can happen. And you're not the first to do that. So yes, you. And, but now you've yeah. learned. You learned that in the process. Now I've learned. Yeah. Okay. So the other relationship is related to water. What you just said, a seed has to have moisture enter the seed coat into the embryo to initiate germination. Seeds will sit there until the conditions are right. And that includes the proper amount of moisture and in addition to temperature and some other things. But you got to have the water. And so that initiates the process underground for the root to come out and the shoot to start to come up. But if we make the soil too wet, the seed can rot before it has a chance to get above the ground. On the other hand, the opposite is true. Just like in all these other examples, they're, they're parallels in the opposite direction on all of these conditions. So 
one of the conditions for not germinating is the soil is too wet. The other one is that it's not wet enough. You know, it's too dry. It needs not only moisture, it needs enough moisture to get into the seed coat to finish the process. And even if, you know, you start off watering the soil like you did, Maria, and maybe, maybe not you're the example, but maybe you stop watering or you don't keep up with the watering and then the soil dries out before the embryo has a chance to absorb enough water to finish the germination process. And so it basically runs out of the water, which in this case is kind of the fuel to drive the engine of germination to allow it to break through the soil surface. So you got to keep up with the watering. And, and specifically, that's another mistake is getting the watering right. So we'll talk about that in more depth, but it's also related to why your seeds aren't germinating is the moisture, whether it's on the stream. Yeah, I think it's hard to take vacation if you're committing to seed starting because that they really do need that daily daily checkup. And last year we we were gone in March and then we were gone in May for my sister's wedding. And so I ended up not starting a bunch. I didn't do my tomatoes from seed, like all the early, really early starts. I didn't end up doing because I knew in March, you know, I wasn't going to pay, I'll pay a houseplant sitter to come once a week, but I'm not going to pay my seed start sitter to come every day to make sure my seeds are okay. So yeah. At least for that too, you know, you can devise a system that provides self-watering to your seed tray basically by a capillary mat that wicks up water in a in a holding tray of water that keeps the soil constantly moist without overwatering it. So that's a topic for another day, but I would be so stressed though. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. yes, I know it's possible, but I would be yeah. stressed. Well, you have to set up your Wi-Fi cam over your seed trays and then check on it, you know, when you're out of town and then you you call your friend if you have to, but not unless you have to. Yeah, that's a good, uh, my bird cam, my, the, the Wi-Fi yeah. puppy cam that I use for my bird, I could put on my right. seeds. That's a great idea. Right. <laughs> Maybe I'll try that next time. Yeah. Anything else about soil moisture, but I definitely think, and say you are a houseplant parent, you know, you got to measure. And then also if you're using a seed germination mat, which heats the soil up, if you're not covering it, then, then that can also dry the soil out. Like you really do. Yes. You have to be checking on your soil moisture every day. And the lights overhead can dry the soil out too. So you have two heat sources yeah. working against maintaining proper moisture in the soil. Got to watch it. Yep. All right. What's your next? So we've got soil moisture. We've got planting depth. What What are some other mistakes you see people make? Yeah. So under that under that first one, Maria, just to recap it, it was the the mistake that the seeds don't germinate for reasons that are within our control. Again, it's either the we planted it when the soil was too hot or too cool, it was too deep or too shallow when we put the seed in the ground, or we didn't maintain proper moisture in the soil. So seeds not germinating, that's the mistake that, you know, a lot of people make for these reasons that I just mentioned. So the next one, number two, is uh, maintaining proper soil moisture. So to expand on what we just talked about, to go into depth, it's its own mistake, because it may be the number one question I get from my students is, you know, how do I know if I'm providing the proper amount of water? Well, first of all, you want to maintain an even amount of soil moisture. The way that you can kind of gauge this is when you have a seed tray that's got the soil mix in it, but you haven't watered it yet. What does that feel like? It's very light. So when it's completely dry and you've just put that soil mix in out of the bag, it's almost as light as a feather. You know, you just don't really feel any weight there. But then when you sat, basically you've sowed your seed and now you saturate the soil to make sure that it's nice and moist like the, like a sponge, like a damp sponge, you know, you squeeze all the excess out and then it's nice like a sponge. A dry sponge is very light. A sponge that you submerged in water and then took out and all the excess runs out, it's significantly heavier. Well, in your seed tray, when you've got enough moisture in the soil, it's significantly heavier. So if you either weigh it, literally you weigh it, when it's dry and when it's wet, you know the extremes. You know, this is what it weighs like when it's completely dry. And this is what it weighs like when the soil is nearly saturated or what we call it. The term is field capacity. That's when soil is fully saturated and all the excess moisture has, has fallen away or run out. It's just what the soil particles are holding in place with the moisture. So field capacity is the saturated level. So what we want to find is about 50% between the two extremes. So you're tracking so far? Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay. So now 
maybe you do weigh it and, and you're wondering, you're looking at your tray now, you've watered it, the seeds are coming up, but you're not sure if it needs more water yet or if uh, you don't, you shouldn't water. Well, it's kind of tricky because if you look at the soil surface and you're standing there looking at your seeds, they've germinated, maybe they haven't or whatever. You're just looking at the soil surface of your seed tray and it looks really dry. Well, that is not, you cannot make the conclusion that the whole seed tray below the surface is dry as well. For the reasons you just talked about between the heat mat and then lights overhead, there's heat, those are heat sources that can lead to evaporation. But just because it's dry at the surface doesn't mean that it's dry all the way through. So what do you do? Well, you could lift that tray up and say, oh, you know, it's heavier than I thought. I thought, and you already know what it feels like when it's totally dry. It's very light. But if you pick it up, chances are it's going to be not very light. It's going to have some water in there because the soil mixes that we buy to start our seeds in are designed to retain moisture. They are engineered to hold moisture. But what you've got to do is, is try to find that happy medium. And you just really can't tell by looking at it. Now, on the wet side, you probably can tell. I should, I should clarify that. When you've overwatered and the water's just sitting in the soil and it's not evaporating because you maybe have a reservoir under the seed tray, there's a solid tray that you put under the seed tray that holds water. And the roots in the seed tray are wicking up the water from that solid tray beneath it. And if there's a lot of water in that solid tray, think of it like a swimming pool. I mean, it's holding water and the roots are, or the soil is drawing it up like a sponge into that seed tray. That can keep the, the soil way too wet. And you can see that because you can look down and you can say, gosh, that soil is so much darker than it was when it was dry. Well, that's a good indication that there's a lot of moisture in there. Now you could buy a moisture meter. You could, you know, those little probes that you can stick into the, into your little cells and it can tell you if it's wet or not. So if you wanted, you know, you want to have a second or backup plan to have something that tells you if it's too wet or too dry, that soil meter will do it. But what I, I like people to do is to learn how to know if it's too wet or too dry. But either way, that can lead to your seeds rotting or not germinating or the seedlings not performing well. So we've got to get to the point that we're looking for a happy medium, somewhere between completely dry and totally saturated. And the best way that I can tell you to do that is to, to get to know the weight and, and just you'll become accustomed to it. You know, that muscle memory will tell you without having to put it on a scale. And if it's got any weight into it at all, chances are it's got enough moisture in it because more plants die from overwatering than underwatering. So it would, it would be better if you aired on the side of slightly dry than too wet. It sounds like understanding what that field capacity is yeah. so that then you can kind of gauge between, you know, what's too dry and what's too wet is really important. And I say the same thing with watering houseplants. Like once you're an experienced plant parent, like that picking the plant up, that is the best way to to understand how how truly saturated the soil is. That's the same process, the same approach, same concept there. Yeah. And you're just doing it with the seed trays. Yeah. Yeah, no, totally. I love that. Especially because that that top layer of soil is going to dry out pretty quickly because of the light, just like you said. That's super helpful. Anything else with uh, soil moisture? I think for this part of the conversation, that gets it. Just be conscious of how much water is in the bottom tray. And you just you just don't want that to be swimming in water all the time. You don't want that soil to be just like super soggy. You know, it just, it needs, roots need to breathe. And if the soil, the cells, the part that holds the soil in your seed tray is saturated, it's pushing the air out of that cell. The air is being forced out and then those roots can't breathe. And so they literally can drown because the air has been pushed out from all the water. So that's why it's so important to not have it too wet. Yeah, don't drown your little seedlings. Don't do that. Yeah, you've worked too hard. That's right. I love it. All right, what's number three? All right, so this is probably the biggest one and maybe I should have saved it for last, but the lighting. The lighting is one that people tend to really get hung up on. And I can see why that's possible. These days, the options that you have for the lighting is infinite. You know, it used to be that you would buy a fluorescent shop light, hang it over your plants, and you would have great success. But we, we've learned, and we, you know, shop lights, the fluorescent tubes, they're, um, they're very effective, but they're not as efficient as modern technology with like LED lights. 
And right. as LED lights became more popular and fluorescent lights have become less popular, grow light manufacturers have continued to refine the options for what LED lights that you can use for your grow lights. And you can spend $20 on an LED light, which the reason why LED lights make a lot of sense, they're far more efficient and they put out a lot less heat energy. And so therefore, the energy that is being put out is put out through the lights that promote the plant growth. That's a very good thing. And it's it's um, far more efficient than those fluorescent lights. So it makes sense economically and for the production of the plant to look at those LED options. But here's the thing. <clears throat> If you are a geek and you wanted to understand what promotes a plant's ability to grow, there are certain frequencies of light that do a better job than other frequencies of light in promoting maximum growth. So blue light frequencies and red light frequencies do a better job than the other light frequencies at promoting growth. Well, if that's the case, do I buy a grow light that emphasizes the blue lights and the red lights? You could do that. Maybe it's more expensive. But now you're getting, now it's just like, oh my gosh, now I got to think about what color light frequency I'm using in my grow light. If you really wanted to geek out on it, you could. But I'm here to tell you, you shouldn't worry about that. Buy from a reputable company, look at the reviews, ask your friends that are already starting seeds what they're using, and don't go overboard on investing in your grow lights. If this is your first year, you may decide that you don't like seed starting. And so you don't want to, you know, break the bank with seed lights because you could do it with these grow lights. There's some very high end grow lights that may lead you to think that the more money you spend on your grow light, the more success you're going to have, but that's not necessarily the case. So I'm a big advocate for starting off with just a reasonable investment on a moderately priced grow light. Maybe it's $20 on the low end, like a shop light setup, but it's an LED light, or maybe spend upwards of closer to $100 if you have more plants that you want to get under that light or you want even more efficiency. But the bottom line is almost any grow light will work as long as you understand how to use it. And that's the key. Spend $20, spend $100. At the end of the day, you can get the same results as long as you understand how to make the $20 light work versus how to make the $100 light work. The $20 light may not be as powerful. It may not put out as many photons. Think of them as raindrops, the ability for that plant to absorb that energy. The $20 light may not put out as many, so you may need to leave the light on for more hours in a day than the one that you spent $100 on. But that's some of the information that hopefully is on the website for the company that sold you that light, or it's online somewhere, it's in our course, you know, your friends that are experienced at this can help you with that. But this is, you know, already in the five minutes we've been talking about lighting, that's just scratching the surface and it can get complicated because it's science. I mean, the science of understanding what causes a plant to grow because of light can be extensive. But again, yeah, I will, I will also encourage, I agree people shouldn't, especially your first year, like don't break the bank, don't overwhelm yourself. But I'll say, man, the first time I got grow light, seed grow lights, I bought a little kit you know, that came with the little bar and the little lever so you could raise and lower. It was so cute. And I think I bought it for 40 or $50. So it's a little bit it it is an investment. But I can't tell you how many times I've used that thing, not just to start seeds, but as a plant resuscitation unit as a if I take cuttings of of my house plants, and I want to just kind of give them a little extra love, like, I do feel like the grow light, I don't know, I personally feel like I guess as an indoor gardener, you're never going to regret buying a grow light. But also light is so important for these little baby seeds after they germinate, you know, if you want to get it right, and you want to make sure you have really juicy, not leggy, you know, tomato plants and, and zinnias and or, you know, whatever else you're starting from seed. I'll just speak for my personal experience, but I feel like I've never regretted a grow light purchase because you just you use them so much over and over again. Well, and let me say this too. I think I think everybody should have a grow light. If they're going to start plants from seed, a south-facing window, a sunny south-facing window, although it seems like it has a lot of light coming in, it's just not enough light for long enough in the period of the day to provide what that seedling really needs to get up and growing. And so the grow light supplements, even if you do have that sunny south-facing window, the grow light 
it's going to provide extra light energy that the plant needs to photosynthesize to really be strong and not leggy, not spindly, because you don't want that. You want a short, stocky, thick stemmed seedling. And by having enough light, that's the number one thing that you should have to get the ideal size seedling is the light. So yes, have a grow light. Yeah, You'll totally. never regret it. And it's an investment, you know, it's an investment that pays a lot of dividends. Totally, totally. All right. What what else you got for me? All right. So, and again, I said this wasn't in any particular order, and this would be a case in point with for that. But gardeners often make the mistake of not reading the information as to when a seed should be planted to give it enough time to grow inside before it's transplanted outside. Oh my God, so guilty. So guilty of this one, Joe. (laughs) Yeah, well, you're not alone, Maria, because this is a big one. And in our enthusiasm, well, usually in our enthusiasm, we plant too quickly. We plant too early in the season and then we do have success, which is usually the case. And then that seedling has grown over the next six to eight weeks to the point that it needs to go outside because it's, it's outgrown its container. The roots want to expand beyond what that container is allowing it to do. It's used up all the nutrients in the soil. It's used up all the energy that the embryo provided it, Mother Nature. And it needs real sunlight. It's grown up. It's, it's a big plant now or a bigger plant, and it needs to be out where nature intended it to be. Here's the problem. By starting too early... It's too cold, potentially, where we live. You know, it's not warm enough. For example, all those warm season seeds that we started, our tomatoes, our beans, our squashes, our cucumbers, whatever it was we started inside, it's too cold for them to go outside yet. So now what do we do? These plants are chomping at the bit, man. Their their roots are getting tighter and tighter inside the container. They're dying for some nutrients. They're dying for more light. And we don't have any of that to offer. And that's what happens when we start too soon. The way that we can fix that is we look on the seed package and it says this, basically I'll paraphrase it, but generally it's almost this verbatim. Start seeds indoors. So there's your first clue. You should start these seeds indoors because not all seeds benefit from indoor starting, but for the sake of argument, these are indoor preferred started seeds. It says start seeds indoors 60 days before the last risk of frost. So right there is the information you need to know, one other thing you need to know, but 60 days before that last risk of frost. So the only other thing you need to know is where I live, wherever that is, what is your last risk of frost date according to Google? You search that term and you're going to get your answer. It may be April 15th. It may be May 1st. It may be May 15th. Whatever it is, you go back in time. You subtract 60 days from April 15th, let's say, and let's call that February 15th. And that's when you sow your seed. But when you do it that way, we know through experience that that seedling is probably just about right in size and root growth to be stocky enough to live outside successfully once that risk of frost is passed. And so paying attention to the information on the seed pack and getting the timing right by subtracting from your frost date to get to those days is really important. And I hope that made sense. Yes. Do not get too impatient and start your seeds early because you have nothing better to do because you're cooped up inside and you just want to start your seeds knowing that your frost date is too far away. Don't do what I did. (laughs) That's right. And you learn as you go, but um, that's an easy one to learn before you make the mistake. Because if, you know, we put that out there and we let people know, here's, here are the things you need to know when you're getting ready to start seed is pay attention to the timing. And here's what you need to know about that. So it's an easy one to avoid, but in our exuberance and our enthusiasm to get our hands in the soil and seeds in the, in the dirt, we often jump the gun and that's okay, but it's better to start a little bit later than a little too soon. I think this also a sidebar of this is, which kind of applies to multiple of the points that you've made. I love a 99 cent seed packet. I love, you know, going to the Goodwill. Well, I was at Goodwill once and there were just a bucket of seed packets that were like 49 cents, right? I love I love a deal, but sometimes especially if you're in be, you're in your beginner era of seed starting, it is so helpful to get a packet of seeds that really has high quality information on the back. Because sometimes with seeds, depending on what type of seed packet you get, 
it's really generic. It doesn't give you it doesn't give you that fro- important frosted information. It doesn't give you the the seed depth, or it gives you one, but it doesn't give you the other. It can be inconsistent. So I think when you're purchasing seeds as well, making sure that you're flipping that seed packet over and you're seeing what information is on the back, just so that you know that you're kind of set up for success, that you're not gonna you know fail. Yes. And I need to add something to that because you raised a very good point. And, you know, seeds that are on sale are either just, you know, left over from the end of the season and the retailer doesn't have any use for them after that because seeds are best when they're in their first year of packaging, basically, when they've been recently harvested and they're for sale in that first year. And that date is on the envelope. So that's another reason why you want to read that package because the other reason why seed pack may be so cheap is because those seeds are more than a year old. Maybe they're two years old, three years old, four years old. It doesn't matter. But it goes back to one of the other reasons that I didn't mention as to why seeds don't germinate is that they're not viable anymore because they're too old. And you need to look at your seed pack to find out when the sell date by sell date for those seeds were. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. And also I like it when the seed packet has like a nice pretty, it's there's, it looks nice too. I like a nice illustration. I like I like colorfuls. I also like to see what the plant's going to look like when it's fully grown. Because, you know, sometimes you want to buy something and just because you don't know the name and you want to try something new, but it's helpful to see <laughs> to see what, what it actually looks like. So I think that's interesting too. All right. Was that number four or was that number five? That's four. Number five is just, okay, so now we've we've started our seeds successfully. They've grown up. The seedlings are beautiful. We've timed it right. And the risk of frost is passed. It's time to plant them outside, but you don't go from straight inside to straight outside. If those seedlings have been living their entire life so far, so over the the last six to eight weeks, indoors under artificial light, even the best grow lights are only a fraction of what the outdoor sunlight is going to be. And think of it this way. If you and I lived in in the upper north where it's cold and dark, you know, all winter long. And then um, somebody gives us a vacation down to Mexico and we get on a plane and we go straight to the beach when we get off the plane and we we're down to our bikini or our, our speedos and we're laying out in the sun, you know, we're going to be beat red that, you know, within an hour of laying out there, we our, our skin wasn't conditioned to that. We didn't acclimate to that. And it, the term for plants acclimating to the full sunlight is called hardening off. And so we have to spend about a week prior to planting them in the ground, anticipating that date, and then easing them into that sunlight to get them used to that a little bit more each day. So a week to 10 days prior to planting them into the ground, we want to start getting them used to that sunlight. So we bring them out the first day for 30 minutes. I'm not kidding, only 30 minutes. And then the next day, it's an hour. And the next day, it's an hour and a half. And the next day, it's two hours. And then maybe it's four hours. And then maybe it's almost a full day. But you just don't go from full on inside to full on outside in one day. Because what you will find if you do that is your leaves are going to be tan or fried or crisp or they're going to be sun scalded. They're blown they're, over. Yeah. They're going to be bleached. They're going to be basically bleached. And then you're going to set yourself back. They probably will survive but you're going to set yourself back at least two weeks from being able to plant them back outside because you've just lost a lot of time. And those leaves that got so bleached, those probably were were killed. But new growth will come on, but now you've got to wait for that. So be careful with that and just ease your plants into that sunlight over the period of seven to 10 days, a little bit more exposure each day for seven to 10 days. That's called hardening off. Very important, but it's worth it. It's a little bit of work, but it's worth it. Definitely worth it. Yeah, it's definitely the most high maintenance aspect of seed starting when, you know, you're taking your seed, your all your trays out in the morning and then bringing them back in. But it's also kind of fun. It's like, wow, I'm I this is like peak of my crazy plant lady moments right now. <laughs> I like it. And every day is a day closer to getting them planted. And and again, you you these are your these are your babies. You've been watching them for their, you know, six to eight weeks of their life. And you're not about to let them get burned up now. So uh, it is kind of fun. Yeah, I love it. So plant friends, Joe has outlined, you know, the most common mistakes. Learn from us. I hope that this episode saves you a mistake or two that you make. But I think, you know, the most important thing that I hope 
you take from this episode is how much Joe and I just want you to try. Just try. Just even if you do, just go get the 99 cent packet and start them in your window and don't do, you know, make all the mistakes we just talked about because you're going to learn through doing and you're going to have so much fun along the way. Yep. Mistakes are okay. Just learn from them. And then you, it was a learning opportunity is what it was. Yeah. In an episode about mistakes, Joe, I want to tell you about the funniest boneheaded move I made. Inspired by you, actually. This is partially your fault. <laughs> I I almost just made Joe spit his coffee out when I yeah. said that. Okay, so I think we had an episode on fall gardening either last year or the year before. And I remember you telling me that you loved growing carrots and that fall vegetables taste the sweetest after a frost. Yep. And so True. with a lot of fall vegetables, you want to give your vegetables a frost. Yep. I tried growing carrots for the first time this year. I had so much fun. I didn't pay a lot of attention to them. This was my like just experimentation. It was kind of a a second-handed like last minute. Okay, we'll sprinkle some carrot seeds in here just to see how they grow, right? Not to necessarily have an epic harvest, but I liked to just watch how they grew. All right. I ended up shading them a little bit too much because I was growing them in grow bags. I grew them with actually, ironically, some flowers that got too tall. But for Thanksgiving, I was like, okay, I'm going to bring these carrots to Thanksgiving at my in-laws. It's going to be great. And they were maybe three inches long. They were like teensy tiny baby carrots. Gourmet carrots is what those are. Gourmet carrots. And they were so sweet. They were so delicious. And there was a frost already. There were maybe two frosts. However, there was a frost the morning that I had to go get the plants out of the grow bags. And the soil was so frozen, I couldn't get the carrots out. So I had to boil water in the kettle and then pour (laughs) boiling water over these carrots. I like boiled them alive to melt the frosted soil in order to remove the carrots. Billy was looking at me and laughing like I've never seen before. It was so funny. However, I did extract the carrots. We did bring them to Thanksgiving and they were tremendously sweet and delicious, but I messed up. Well, I mean, you just harvested them before they were mature. But the beauty of carrots is you can eat them at three inches, even if they are 10 or 12 inches at maturity, you can eat them early. That's nothing wrong with that. And that's what restaurants do, you know? So that was not a fail. Well, I feel like I failed because I left them in the in the ground for too long because they already were frozen solid. But could I have left them in and let them keep growing in the frozen soil? Ideally, probably not. You don't want to leave, let them sit in frozen soil for too long. Yeah. In New York? No, I think the biggest mistake was that they didn't get enough sun. So they just, they didn't get to grow big enough because they didn't get enough sun to their greens. But anyway, who cares? It was fun and it was a fun, a funny story. Anyway, back to seed starting. If you want to seed start successfully and <laughs> don't make my bonehead carrot. I I planted them too close together too. But anyway, I'm a multiple time graduate of your seed starting. I have successfully started many seeds. I've grown full tomato plants from seed. I've grown flowers from seed. I've grown all sorts of things from seed, peas, beans, you name it. Because of your class, you are in launch mode right now. Your enrollment is only open for a very limited amount of time. So can you tell us all about master seed starting and where, how people can join and why they should join? Yeah, well, Master Seed Starting was uh, one of our early courses. We've got quite a few in the Online Gardening Academy now, but even so, this course is the most popular because it's a discipline and a skill that people want to know if they want to grow their own food. And it's a language. It's a different language. It is. It is. And there's a lot of nuances with seed starting. And there's things to know if you want to be successful at growing your own food, you're going to want to start that food from seed and you want to know how to do that. And depending on what it is you want to grow, there are unique things to know about those particular seeds. But once you are equipped and empowered with that knowledge, it just opens up so many doors and then you can apply that information to everything you grow going forward. And once you know it, you know it and you only get better at it. But until you practice the skills and you have an opportunity to be taught the right way to do it by in my case, me, who's been doing it for decades, you don't necessarily know it. You may make a lot of mistakes and it may take you several years to finally figure it out and get it right. But uh, we want to shortcut that. We want to get you successful in the first year 
and empower you to feel better and smarter and more confident in your seed starting and gardening and growing and enjoy the fruits of your labor, literally, and have a ball doing it. But when you feel confident in what you're about to do, it just changes everything. And it's more fun. It's less stressful. uh, There's less expense involved. We help you eliminate those costly mistakes of getting the wrong lights and getting the wrong soil and getting the right seed. It's uh, There's a lot to know in saving money. And that alone pays for the cost of the course. I mean, when, when we talk about potentially the equipment involved to scale it up or get the grow lights or whatever, it can be quite an investment. It doesn't have to be, but I like to show people in my slide in the in the course when I'm talking about the course. I I show a slide of just one tray of tomato seedlings, just um, that 10 inch by 20 inch tray with you know 36 plants in it. And I say, do you know I sell these seedlings to our neighbors? I mean, people snatch them up. I can't keep them in stock because everybody wants a homegrown tomato plant, and they don't all want to start them from seed. So that's why we we grow so many for our neighbors. But anyway, we sell those seedlings for seven dollars each. And one tray, selling one, maybe one and a half trays of those pays for the course. And it's like, wow, I can get my money back that quickly and have all that knowledge and lifetime access to webinars and to Zoom calls. And we have a private community group. It's just, there's just so much. People rave about that course. The lifetime access is so helpful because... I take it every year with you again. Like I just go back to the course when it's time for me to start seeds the next time around. Of course, I'm always going to try starting something different. Of course, I always want to tweak and review. And so, you know, the first time I watched every video module, you know, I it was, you know, my Bible. Next time around, maybe I'm not watching every single video module, but I it's so helpful to be able to go back and be like, oh, you know what? I might want to tweak my lighting. Let me go back and watch the lighting thing. Or, oh, I think I did the spacing thing wrong. Let me go make sure that I review that. And then I just get to kind of use the course as a little tutorial. And it's so much easier than just, you know, searching YouTube for hours and hours and hours. <laughs> well, and think about that. That's a really good point. Because so you can watch. So there's endless videos on any subject on YouTube. Some people know what they're talking about. Some people don't, but anybody can post on YouTube. So first of all, do you even know if you're getting reliable information? Secondly, even if you ask them a question, they may or may not get back to you. In a book, you know, there's a lot of great information in books. I wrote a whole book recently on organic vegetable gardening. But if you have a question based on what you read, you could maybe email me. And if I see it, I'll hopefully be able to email you back. But Maybe not. And information changes. But when you're in a course, an interactive course with an instructor that goes through the course with you and gives you access to the instructor with forums and community groups and emails and just having somebody accessible to you to answer your questions for you as they come up and they don't all happen at the same time. As you go through your seed starting journey, you continue to have new questions. Wouldn't it be nice to have somebody that you can go to that's your your guide to success? to be able to ask those questions too. And so that's what we provide in the course is that that kind of access. Yeah, it's so worth it. I don't think I could give it a better endorsement than the fact that I take it every year. <laughs> but yeah, we're going to have special promos. The launch is very short. So the doors are closing for Master Seed starting when? I believe at the time of this recording, the doors close on the 29th of January. So the doors close on the 29th. This episode's airing this week. So go get this course and we're going to have promos for you. They're going to be in the show notes. You know, if you follow me on Instagram, I'll make sure that that everybody knows what those promos are on Instagram. But take the class, plant friends, be in it with me, learn alongside me. I'll be taking it again this year, living in a different zone, living in a different garden zone. So I feel like I'm going to have to retake your entire course because now I have to view it through a completely different lens of those frost dates. Well, you will need to apply that information. Yes. Yeah, which will be very interesting. So Joe, you're the best. Where can everyone find you and then maybe find more information about Master Seed Starting? Yes, joegardener.com. That's an easy one. joegardener.com is the primary website. And then you can go to joegardener.com slash MSS for Master Seed Starting to learn about the course and get all that information and sample outlines of the course and some other things. So that's where you should go to learn more about the course. Yeah. And we'll have everything in the show notes. So Joe, it's been so fun as ever. Can't wait to have you back on soon. And uh, you're the best. 
Thank you, Maria. Thanks for having me. It was good to be here. And um, the best of luck to your listeners who may come on board and take on seed starting for the first time. Yeah. Thank you, Joe, for joining me again. I love him. He's like my garden go-to. I feel like when I need a garden episode, I'm like, hey, Joe, do you have time to come talk with me? (laughs) He's such a great expert, but he really makes it so palatable. And I love that about him as a podcast guest. I love that about him on his podcast, his own podcast. But also I love that about him as a teacher. And like I said, I've taken that master seed starting course like three times. I take it every year when I start my own seeds because there's always something new that I learn. And if you want $100 off that course, this discount is only available through this upcoming Monday, January 29th. You can go to growingjoywithmaria.com slash seed starting. It'll take you to a special web page that the, the discount is already applied. So if you are interested in doing master seed starting this year, taking your knowledge and education to the next level to set you and your garden up for success, you can get $100 off by going to growingjoywithmaria.com slash seed starting. I hope this was helpful. DM me at growingjoywithmaria on Instagram and let me know what you're starting from seed this year. I want to know. And until next time, my sweet plant friends, keep growing joy. Plant friend, thank you for tuning in today. It means so much to me that I get to be part of your planty journey. If you like what you heard, make sure you're subscribed to the show so you never miss an episode. We have so many incredible interviews and solo episodes on incredible houseplant and gardening topics that you will not want to miss this year. And while you're over there in the podcast player subscribing, why don't you click over to the review section of Growing Joy with Plants and leave us a review. Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast, so thanks in advance. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got so many options for you. First, I highly recommend you taking the plant parent personality test. It's free. It's super fun. It takes three minutes to complete. At the end of the test, you're going to get your plant parent personality profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you and your lifestyle inspired by your results. The links are in the show notes. If you're looking to uplevel your plant parent game, I have so many free downloads on my website that I think could help you, like the Understanding Natural Light download or nine different ways to green up your office space. If you'd like to support the show monetarily and help me bring the show to as many people as possible for free, you can head to our Patreon link in the show notes to learn more about our offerings. And finally, I invite you to come hang out with me and continue the planty conversation on social media, on Instagram and TikTok. I'm growing joy with Maria. My DMs are always open if you have requests for topics or ideas for the show. Thank you again for listening. It is truly my honor and delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy.